Hello everyone, it is I, Sweet Gwendolyn, aka Debbie Penetration. And I have done a lot of reading during my queer quarantine time, and so I've decided to make a little video giving a quick mini book reports on the eight books I have read so far. So we're gonna start with Just Kids by Patti Smith. For those who are not familiar with Patti Smith, she was an incredibly kick-ass female musician in the, or rock and roller, I should specifically say, in the early 70s. She kicked ass, she kicked down a lot of doors, she was amazing. And she was originally lovers and ultimately just like soulmate level best friends with Robert Maplethorpe. If you are not familiar with Robert Maplethorpe, he was a completely groundbreaking, um, I guess, high art, low brow artist. And sure, he took pictures of flowers and portraits, but who cares about that when he took high art, fully explicit, hardcore BDSM photos? More on that in a few more books. Uh, but he was remarkable. He tragically died of AIDS, but they were completely connected and best friends for his entire life from the moment they met through the end. And it's just a really great, well-written, entertaining, compelling uh, tale of their friendship. And also like they were around adjacent, immediately adjacent to the Andy Warhol scene. They knew a lot of the transgender superstars that comes up in the book. And yeah, it's just an interesting snapshot of, um, you know, queer slash avant-garde 1970s New York, uh, as well as just a lot of uh, interesting insight into their lives. It won a lot of uh, awards and it was on the bestseller list for forever. So highly recommended. Next up, The Cat in the Hat uh, in both English and Spanish. So AKA El Gato in Sombrerado. And I guess I just had not revisited this book since my childhood because what it turns out this book is actually about is a sociopath cat that breaks into a house when only two children are home by themselves, completely trashes the place, nearly murders a sentient talking fish, uh, manages to clean things up at the last moment and flees the house to escape arrest. So, I don't know, uh, recommended, not recommended, depends on what you're into, but it did help me with my Spanish and I'm currently on day 173 of Duolingo Spanish. So um, whether you like the story or not, it uh, that edition will help you with your Spanish. Uh, next up, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, it is so good. It is incredibly fast, quick, easy, engrossing, high quality read. I can't say enough nice things about it. I hesitate to try to sum up the story just because I don't want to ruin anything. But in a nutshell, uh, the main character uh, is a woman who lives in an all black uh, town in 1930s Florida. And it's just very good, very worth reading. And like I said, extremely fast. I tore through it and I normally go at a certain pace, but that I just did in one gulp. <laughs> so speaking of Robert Maplethorpe, I was inspired to get this book. There are a lot of compilations of his work. So I should specifically say that if you are looking for the extreme hardcore BDSM photos. Those are actually compiled in another book called Pictures. I think actually Pictures, period. <laughs> and this, however, does still have some explicit content, which I shall show you momentarily. Um, but before I crack open the book, how things used to work was way before the digital era, film was expensive. <laughs> and so what film companies would do is they would if there was like a high profile artist, they'd give them their film for free because then they could say, hey, look at what this amazing artist was able to do with our film. Although that was probably not the photo they used to call attention to that. But um, so yeah, for several years, he pretty exclusively worked with Polaroid because they were giving him free uh, free film and cameras. And I will preface this by saying, um, 
I'm about to show you a bit of nudity. If you do not want to see nudity, you should close your eyes for roughly the next 60 seconds. But uh, this is a photo from 1980 of Lisa Lyon, who was the, I believe, uh, that year's female bodybuilding champion. He mainly did the male form, but he liked uh, heavily muscled women as well. And Patti Smith was just his muse. He took more photos of her than anyone else, I mean, by far, in his life. So they, they were always non-explicit, but just I was just talking about Patti Smith. So there are some photos of her. There are quite a few in this book. But to get back to the sexy content, well, I mean, I'm not saying Patti Smith isn't sexy, I guess I mean ex explicit to semi-explicit content. Peter Berlin was an extremely famous 70s porn star, and he worked with Maple Thorpe uh, for at least one shoot. And so these are two photos of Peter Berlin. This one, just so tantalizingly cut off the bottom of the frame there, but it's still a very sexy photo. And one last one, you were teased with the cover art that had the uh, censored version. So here is the uncensored version, which is a self-portrait uh, with his Polaroid camera. And if I recall correctly, he used this photo for the invitation to one of his art shows. So uh, there's plenty more content like that in the book. And again, highly recommended. Next up. Femme in Public by Alok Vade Menon. And I, again, highly recommend it. I saw Alok for the first, and I guess so far only time, at Gender Unbound, I believe two years ago. And to date, they're really one of the most remarkable uh, queer performers I have encountered. And they're just a, a very amazing poet and th I bought this from them uh, after their show. It's a compilation of their poetry along with photos like that and although the line does not appear in this book uh, they said one of the more profound things that I I think will reverberate through the rest of my life. Uh, they had a line in one of their poem poems uh, that was we have to love each other more than they hate us. And I think of that line uh, and draw comfort from it every time something horrible happens. Also, they are a genderfuck trans person, so a person after my own heart. Okay, this next one is my complete pick of the litter. It is We Both Laughed in Pleasure, The Selected Diaries of Lou Sullivan, 1961 to 1991. And also... It's a little hard to see, but there is a butt. That's a butt on the cover. And Lou Sullivan, if you haven't heard of him, and you are not alone, I feel like most people have not heard of them because I don't feel like people care that much about trans guys, but he is one of our modern queer ancestors who really changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Um, on the explicitly trans guy level, he founded uh, FTM Quarterly, which actually still exists. He started it, uh, I think, in the early 80s. And it was the very first network for trans guys. It was a publication as well as, like, a network, and people could get in touch with each other. And Because at that time, although trans guys actually make up, or trans masculine people, I should say, make up half of the transgender population, uh, just even now, but especially then, you say the word transgender and everyone thinks of trans feminine people. So uh, most uh, trans masculine people felt very alone and isolated. And so this was the first time in uh, the modern era, at least, um, that trans guys were able to connect with each other. And then what he did that affected everyone uh, was that when he was trying to transition, he was initially denied access to hormones because they had never heard of a trans guy who was attracted to men. Uh, of the few trans guys that were known to, I guess, medical science and were receiving treatment, they had all come up from the lesbian community because uh, it's true now as it was then. Uh, most people can usually articulate their 
sexual orientation before they can uh, articulate their gender identity. And so th they were just like, well, wh why would you want to take hormones to be a gay man? You know, don't, don't you, you know, the, to, in their mind, the point was to transition and be heterosexual and be, that's what makes you normal is transitioning. And, um, he totally could have lied and said, you know, oh yeah, yeah, women, they're, I'm totally into them. But he was like, this is wrong. This is crap. It doesn't make any sense. Gender identity and sexual orientation are two totally different things. And he, you know, wrote articles and like The Advocate. He went on TV and talked about it. He lobbied a lot within uh, medical associations and he won. And so because of him, and it happened in his lifetime, it was in the 80s, uh, the standard of care, uh, the official medical standard of care for treating transgender people was to A, for the first time, uh, officially recognize that gender identity and sexual orientation are two totally different things, and uh, B, that basically t stated that no one should be denied access to um, gender-affirming care if they seek it out. I mean, it took a while for that to become reality, and even now some people struggle to access it, but back then, uh, the gatekeeping was a lot worse than it is now, and ironically, I wound up reading the very scene in this book where he was having his appointment trying to get hormones while I was in the Kine Clinic in the room waiting for the doctor to come in and talk to me about giving me hormones. And yeah, my experience was totally different than Lou Sullivan's experience, and it's because he had that experience and changed the world. Oh, and also, he's a funny guy. This is hilarious. This isn't just like, you should know your history. This is hilarious. It, oh my God, he was very sexually adventurous and he was just so full of humor and insight and it doesn't matter if you're trans or not. This book is just, it's another like completely wild ride and is highly, highly recommended. Next up. The Faggots and Their Friends Between Revolutions by Larry Mitchell, illustrated by Ned Asta. And this book was written in 1977, as far as I can tell, for this exact moment in 2020, because the revolution is indeed finally starting to happen. Uh, this book, it's only 113 pages. Oops. It's, um, and most pages are individual chapters. Uh, so like, Th that one paragraph, that's like one chapter. And there's a lot of art and illustrations in it as well. So it's a really fast and easy read. Essentially, it uh, takes place in a supposed far off land that just happens to be completely identical to ours. And it is um, an incredibly insightful assessment of straight, queer, and trans people that is, yeah, it's a little unusual to see something that that well put, and it's also fun. So I, I recommend that as well. Next up, Myra Breckenridge by Gore Vidal. So Gore Vidal was a humorist, a novelist, an essayist, and uh, he wrote a lot of very popular uh, nonfiction history books. And Myra Breckenridge is probably one of his most famous slash notorious uh, books that he wrote. It was actually like a blockbuster bestseller before it was even released. Like just the buzz was huge. Um, it's about a uh, transgender character. So that was like part of the uh, sensationalism. The, bo the book came out in 1968. And uh, so it's a, kind of a queer classic, which is what made me interested in picking up. The movie, which he wrote the screenplay for, came out in 1970. And it for reasons I don't understand, it's considered like a horrible movie, but I liked it. But major asterisk here. Uh, it is one of the few times the book is like, um, sorry, the movie is a million times better than the book. And the main reason for that is that this book has aged horribly in light of the Me Too movement. Um, and I think that, um, and I should say I'm going to have like a minor spoiler here. So skip ahead if you don't want to hear about it. <laughs> I'm going to make it pretty quick. But essentially, uh, there's a scene um, that is, I don't know, it's just, it's handled horribly. I mean, like, 
horribly in the book. I honestly did not enjoy the book at all, and I can't believe that this movie is written by the exact same guy. The movie is like this really fun, uh, ultra campy, wild ride, star-studded cast and everything. So the same scene in the movie is handled completely differently. Uh, it still is there, but um, I should say, it's, so it, it's a female on male incident. And the way it's done in the movie, though, is that it's sort of like a, honestly, it's like a femdom jack-off reel for men. You know, the naughty nurse has to do a very thorough exam. And I feel like it could be triggering, but at the same time, if you know it's there and you opt in, it's an otherwise very, very fun, cool movie. It's on YouTube for free if you want to check it out. So, don't recommend the book. I recommend the movie if you feel up to it. Last one. Moose Book Cookbook. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Moosewood Restaurant Cookbook from 1996, although they've put out many editions over the years. I think the most recent one is uh, 2013. And the reason I'm actually saying this uh, as like a book I'm reading is like I actually am reading the whole thing. Uh, all these are just the, the first wave of recipes I want to try. But apart from the recipes, it has a huge amount of nutritional information and just information about food. Uh, my point in bringing this up is that queer and transgender people tend to have much uh, worse than average health outcomes. And when you're an oppressed person and you are just going through life trying to survive, when you come home, it's a lot easier to just zap the thing in the microwave or dump the thing out of the can and heat it up. But there are a lot of recipes that are extremely easy. It doesn't have to be this cookbook. I mean, there are lots of cookbooks out there. Um, but there are a lot of very easy recipes that are just, they're so easy and they're good and they're good for you. So I would suggest that uh, it's worth it to just learn a couple a simple things that you can make yourself and uh, just to nourish yourself, you know, and to give yourself the extra fuel you need when you're going out there to, you know, fight for your survival and everyone else's. But anyway, that is it. Oh, wait, footnote, footnote. All right, here's the tie-in that made me read this is that when I was reading the bios on the faggots and their friends between revolutions, I saw that Ned Asta, the illustrator, was a part of the Moosewood Collective. That was like this uh, hippy-dippy commune-owned restaurant in Ithaca, New York. And I was like, wait a minute, I have their cookbook. I've had this since like right after college and I never even looked at it that much. But I looked and sure enough, he was one of the authors of this cookbook. So that's your, your queer-influenced cookbook. So. Anyway, I really recommend seven out of nine of these books, and um, and so I guess that's it. I, I and I have I could do another one of these again soon because I'm always reading several books at once, and I've got several I'm on the cusp of finishing. So stay tuned for another installment of queer quarantine reading coming soon. Bye bye.